يا ربي لك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا ما رضيت ولك الحمد بعد الرضاء ولك الحمد أبدا 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 والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم سيقول السفهاء من الناس ما ولاهم عن قبلتهم التي كانوا عليها قل لله المشرق والمغرب يهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم وكذلك جعلناكم أمة وسطا لتكونوا شهداء على الناس ويكون الرسول عليكم شهيدا وما جعلنا القبلة التي كنت عليها إلا لنعلم من يتبع الرسول ممن ينقلب على عقبيه وإن كانت لكبيرة إلا على الذين هدى الله وما كان الله ليضيع إيمانكم إن الله بالناس لرؤوف الرحيم وبشح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين In today's brief khutbah, I'd like to share with you some reflections from the very middle of Surah Al-Baqarah. And in honor of Surah Al-Baqarah, many things can be said, but I'll just very briefly share with you a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in describing to us the rank and the position of this beautiful surah. He says, لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ سَنَامٌ وَسَنَامُ الْقُرْآنِ الْبَقَرَةِ Everything has a peak. The word sanam is used in the Arabic for the hump of a camel, the highest point of it. He says everything has a hump, has a peak. And the peak of the Qur'an is Al-Baqarah. It's this surah. He says this because this surah contains in it everything that is mentioned everywhere else in the Qur'an. If you're looking for anything in the Qur'an, on any subject matter, there is some point, there's some reference to it found in this remarkable surah that Allah revealed to His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the place I want to share with you, the couple of ayat that I want to talk to you about today belong to the very middle of this surah. These are ayat numbers 142 and 143 and I'll try to focus my energies more on the 143rd ayah. But a little bit of background is necessary. The Prophet ﷺ has moved to Medina. So this is a Madani surah, some consider it one of the early Madani surahs. He's moved to Medina and now his audience وسلم, is different. The mushrikun of Arabia were different. That's a different audience. And now he's come into contact with a Christian and a Jewish community. More so. There was interaction before this, but it was very indirect or very minimal. But now there is direct interaction with the Jewish and the Christian community. And in particular, the Jewish community, Allah Azza wa Jal chose to address first. And you'll find an interesting thing. A long address with the Christian community is found in the next surah in Al Imran. And a long conversation with the Jewish community is found in Al Baqarah. One of the fundamental reasons that the Jewish community of Arabia decided to reject Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam by and large, the reason they rejected him is that he didn't belong to the family. He wasn't from the children of Ishaq. He was from the children of Ismail. So he wasn't from the chosen group. He wasn't quite one of them. And this was one of the fundamental reasons for rejecting this messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. 
Now you should know that when Allah Azza wa Jal revealed the Quran and He revealed His instructions and even the manasik, the rituals of Islam to His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a lot of them are a continuation of what Allah gave to Musa Alayhi Salam. A lot of what we follow is a continuation of the Sharia given to Musa Alayhi Salam. And so as part of that, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam early on used to fast on the same days as the Jews. He used to pray in the same direction as the Jews did. He used to even pray in the same direction. And actually even claimed Ashura, the day of victory for Musa alayhi salam, as a day of fasting and celebration even for the Muslims. So there's a lot of parallel. Allah Azza wa Jal exposes in Surah Al-Baqarah that there is a knowledgeable group among the people of Medina, among the Jewish community, a knowledgeable people, that have actually done their homework. And they looked into this messenger. And they found that he fits every single description that was given about him in their books. So they came to a conclusion that this in fact is the Messenger of Allah. And at the same time, they came to a very strange conclusion also. That no matter what, we will not follow him. No matter what, we will not accept him as a Messenger. Because we're kind of, it's almost like saying we're kind of mad at Allah. We're mad at God. How come he sent it to the wrong address? So in this, in this surah, what Allah Azza wa Jal does is, you know, they started even blaming Jibreel alayhi salam. You know that? They started, you know, Jibreel, he's the messenger, so he must have got the wrong recipient because he should have come to one of ours. So Allah defends Jibreel alayhi salam in Surah Al-Baqarah. He says, Man kana Jibreel, fa innahu nazzalahu ala qalbik bi Whoever wants to be an enemy to Jibreel, well, he is the one who sent it upon your heart by Allah's permission. So he let him know. And then he told, tell him, tells him on top of that, Man kana aduwa lillahi wa malaikatihi wa rusulihi wa jibreela wa mikala wa mikala. Fa inna Allah aduwa lil kafirin. Whoever becomes an enemy to any one of them, Jibreel, Mikal, any of the messengers to Allah, then they should know they've become an enemy of Allah Himself. Allah comes to the aid of His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so Allah reminds the Jews, if there's any ounce of Sincerity left, listen, he's not from another family. You come from the same father, Ibrahim. So the ayat of Baqarah start reminding the Jewish community of the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. When he said to his children, he asked them a question. It's very beautiful, the way Allah places this in Al-Baqarah. There's a conversation between Ibrahim alayhi salam and his children. And he asked him, and this is the same question asked by Ya'qub alayhi salam in the Quran. وَوَصَّى بِهَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ بَنِيهِ وَيَعْقُوبُ Listen to this ayah very carefully. Ibrahim alayhi salam left a will for his children. He gave them parting advice. And so did Ya'qub. In other words, Ibrahim alayhi salam, you know who that is. His son Ishaq and Ishaq's son Ya'qub. Two generations of a difference. The grandfather long ago said something to his kids and a generation later, the grandson is saying the same exact thing to his kids on his deathbed. The, the generational tradition is being continued. In one ayah, two generations, even three, right? Because it's the grandson. Now what did they say to their children? Ya baniya, inna Allah astafa lakumuddin. My beloved children, it is Allah. He has chosen the religion for you. Fala tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Don't you dare die except that you're Muslims. Now listen to that. Who said this? Ibrahim said to his kids, don't you die except that you are Muslims. Ya'qub alayhi salam. You want to know what his other name is? His other name is Israel. Ya'qub's other name is Israel. That comes in Ali Imran. Israel is being told, my son. Israel is telling his children. He's telling the sons of Israel. He's telling them, listen, Allah has chosen the deen for you. Don't you dare die except that you are Muslims. They're being reminded. That this is not something new to you. This Islam is something your father gave you. And the father, his own grandfather started this tradition. Ibrahim alayhi salam. Why are you, what basis do you have left to reject? But now, the, war, the time for warnings is done. Allah azza wa jal basically gave them an exhaustive argument. An exhaustive argument. Opportunity after, after opportunity to come to the truth. And then it became clear that these people are no longer interested in the truth. Something else needs to be said. And that is that Bani Israel were in the habit of causing pain to their messengers. They were in that habit. They didn't even spare the one by, who, by Allah's permission, the one who helped them cross the water. They didn't even spare him. Even he says in the Quran, Lima tu'dhunani, why do you cause me pain? Even he says that to Bani Israel. Why do you cause me pain? 
you know. They, they told him, Atatakhiduna huzwa, do you take us as a joke? When he would bring instructions to them, he would say, are you kidding? That's what they would say to him. This is their messenger. That's how they would talk to their, their messenger, the one that they take so much pride in, right? But now Allah Azza wa Jal is about to close the doors. And to those who knew that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is in fact the final messenger, they knew, they knew, they had that knowledge. But they still kind of said, but come on, he still prays in the same direction as us. He still fasts on the same days as we do. So Allah is still kind of on our side. What does Allah do? He changes the Qibla. Allah changes the Qibla. And now the Muslims, you, saw, you see when the Prophet ﷺ moved to Medina, before he moved, he used to pray to the Kaaba. But he used to pray in a way that the Kaaba is in front of him and Al-Aqsa is in front of him. So they're lined up together. Even though his original instruction is to pray to Al-Aqsa, he still has the, father, the, the house built by his father, Ibrahim salam in front of him. When he goes to Medina, that's impossible. Because when he prays towards Aqsa, his back is to Mecca. His back is to Mecca. So if he's going to pray towards Mecca, his back is going to be to Al-Aqsa. That's what's going to happen. Allah gives him the instruction to turn his back. And remarkably, you know who's really offended by this? Bani Israel. The Jews of Medina. Hey, this is the ayah. Sayaqulu sufaha min al nas. The idiots from among the people are soon going to say, Ma wallahum an qiblatihim. What turned them away from their qibla? What turned them away from their direction of prayer? Allati kanu alayha. The one they were committed to. What happened? Why are you guys praying in a different direction now? Here's the very simple question. If you believe that these Muslims are not on the truth, then whether they pray east, west, north, or south, what do you, what do you care? <laughs> what do you care? I mean, if you don't believe they're on the truth, then you shouldn't be offended if they're praying at all. The fact that they got angry and they said, these fools, why are they praying in that direction? Something's up. They just exposed themselves, they exposed the knowledge that they held within. مَا وَاللَّهُمْ عَنْ قِبْلَتِهِمْ وَالَّتِي كَانُوا عَلَيْهَا And Allah says to them, قُلِّ اللَّهِ الْمَشْرِقُ وَالْمَغْرِبُ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ إِلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Tell them, Allah owns the East and the West, and He guides whoever He wants to a straight path. Now when Allah says, there's something beautiful inside these ayat. When Allah says He guides whoever He wants to a straight path, the Muslims have just been guided towards the Qibla. Isn't that true? To Al-Masjid Al-Haram, the Kaaba. But you know, in it there's a hint, there's a clue. If Allah is guiding us to that house, to the Kaaba, and that Kaaba at that moment when this ayah came down, that Kaaba was surrounded by idols. It was surrounded at that time by idols. When Allah says He will guide the Muslims to a straight path, and He's just guided them to the Kaaba, He's already dropped a hint that I will send you back to Kaaba, and you will be cleaning up that house. That will be, that will be the completion of your guidance, because I'm guiding you back to that house. This became the capital of the Ummah. The capital of the Ummah is now Al-Makkah. Al the capital, the place we converge, our faces converge every few hours across this world. This became our capital. It's a symbol of us becoming a new ummah. And then Allah added another, you know, salt on the wound. After these ayat, what, is he, what, are, what are the ayat next? Oh, by the way, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. The month of Ramadan is the one in which the Qur'an was revealed. That is the guidance for humanity. Hudal nasi not just hudal li bani Israel, hudal lil nasi wa bayyinati min al-huda wal-furqan. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْهُ Whoever witnesses the month from among you, he should fast. On that month. So now the months of the, of the following of the Bani Israel stopped. So it's completely known that one ummah that had that status, Bani Israel, they had a status, is gone. And now a new ummah is being inaugurated by two things, two major things. One, the change of the Kaaba, and two, the install, installation of the month of Ramadan. These two things are identifying us as a distinct new nation, completely separate from Bani Israel, completely separate from them. Subhanallah, how Allah, you know, sets us apart. And as a, as a statement of setting us apart, He honored us with the following ayah. Because now we're a new nation, we're a separate nation. He says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً That is how we made you an ummah. وَسَطًا Balanced. A balanced nation, a balanced, a middle, wasat, sometimes in Arabic it even means the middle of something. You are the middle nation. It begs the question, what does that mean? What does it mean to be the middle nation? It's a very important thing for us to understand. There are two nations that Allah alludes to in Surah Al-Fatiha as you know. When we are told to stay away from two paths that can go the wrong way, we are told to stay away from غير المغضوب عليهم wa وَلَا 
And I will give you one of the simplest explanations that inshallah you will remember and you will teach your children of what these two paths mean. Essentially our deen, this truth, is a combination of two things. It is a combination of two things. One, it is knowledge. It's good, sound, accurate knowledge. That is one. But just because you have knowledge is not enough. You must now take that knowledge and change your life. I'll call that action. There are two things in this deen. You have to have knowledge, and that knowledge must transform into action. These are the two fundamentals of our religion. I mean, I'll give you a, a silly example just to make the point, get the point across. Just because you know fire burns, you know that. It's not enough. Now you must act and not touch it. Right? It would be foolish to know something and still act in contradiction to what you know. Now that you know the truth, you must act upon it. These are the two conditions of a proper commitment to the straight path, the path that we asked Allah for. Now there are two kinds of problems. There's a person who knows a lot but doesn't act on it. That's one problem. That's one problem. He knows a lot. He's got one, one half of the picture. He knows a lot but he doesn't act on it. Here's another problem. There's a person who really wants to act, wants to do good things. But you know what the problem is? He doesn't know much. He doesn't know much. So he's doing things as best his imagination tells him. It's not really based on knowledge. So you, the two problems before you are, either you have knowledge without action, or you have action without knowledge. You've got two problems. Now if you pay attention to Bani Isra Jews and the Christians, that Allah talks about extensively in the Qur'an. The, the problem of the Israelites was they had a lot of knowledge. Allah testifies to their knowledge. They understood the book, يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ They even recognized their mes this messenger وسلم, like they would their own children. Man, if, if a kid starts crying in the back during the khutbah, you'll know that's mine. You will know. That's how well they recognize this messenger وسلم, Allah testifies to their knowledge but that knowledge, unfortunately, didn't transfer into action. What happens on the Christian side of things? Allah talks about them meaning well, doing good things. And yet, when it comes to even the most fundamentals of knowledge, the doors are closed. The doors to knowledge are closed. They're re refusing to think, refusing to want to learn. That becomes a problem on the other end. We were made the middle nation. The nation that finds the balance between two sides. The, the side of action and the, si the side of knowledge and the side of action. We're right down the middle. That's one of the many benefits of Allah calling us the middle nation. Now, why were we made the middle nation? You know, you, you would think this is a cause for celebration. We are finally made a middle nation. Yes, awesome. But Allah Azza wa Jal never gives an honor. He never gives a position except that He brings with it a lot of responsibility. So in the same ayah, it's not even the next ayah. You can't even finish this ayah without getting to the responsibility. This ayah is not just about the honor. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَىٰ is the honor. But Allah didn't stop at the honor. He, then He piled on us the responsibility, the burden that comes with being an ummah. You can't just be an ummah and say, Alhamdulillah, we're the ummah of Muslims. Allah made us an ummah. That's not enough. That's not enough. And by the way, if that was enough, you would be just like Bani Israel, who said we're the chosen people. That's enough for us. We don't need to take any responsibility because we already got the boarding pass to Jannah, we're set. You know, that's not the case with us. What did Allah say? I've made you a middle nation so you can be witnesses against all people. You and I are, have been made a member of this ummah and our fundamental task as an ummah is that we become witnesses against humanity. You know what that means? That we carry Islam when we open our mouth and we carry Islam with our character, the way we do business with people, the kinds of neighbors we are, the way we cross the street, the way we talk back, the way we deal with ignorance. We are constantly witnesses against humanity that this is what a Muslim is. Your co-workers are going to the party, they're going to the bar, they're going to have a beer, and you're going to say no. And you're going to advise them against it too. This is not good. I know you're not Muslim, but it's still not good for you. I mean, I, Allah gave us the honor to be at the service of humanity. We don't just look out for the good of the ummah, we even look out for the good of humanity. That's what we're supposed to be. You are witnesses against people of what this truth is. But if you and I, if our Islam, if our dedication to Allah does not go beyond the four walls of this masjid, if we are a different person outside, and we're a different person in here, 
and you wouldn't recognize that person outside. You wouldn't know, is that the same guy I saw at the masjid? Really? He's Muslim? Oh my God. <laughs> Subhanallah. <laughs> you know? Then that's a, this is a serious problem. Then we, and by the way, what shahada ala nas, this concept that is so heavy in our deen, you know what that means? On judgment day, people that were around us, that had the opportunity to interact with us, that saw us, that were with us, our coworkers, our friends, our neighbors, even our non-Muslim family, all of them will testify on judgment day that this Muslim that was my friend, my coworker, my neighbor, I never saw a glimpse of Islam in him. He never brought it up. It's not my fault. They will have a case against us. Even though they have their own responsibility, we are supposed to be witnesses against them, because if we're not witnesses against them, they will be witnesses against us. It's, it's either one or the other. We're going to court either way. Judgment day, we're going to court either way. But it's, you, we have to decide what, which side we're going to stand on. And if this isn't bad enough, Allah Azza wa adds another responsibility. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger is mentioned. He says, وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ shahida." And the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, will be a witness against you. The messenger will be a witness against you. The ayah is not done. The ayah is still not done. But I want to focus on this part of the ayah. It's a very heavy part of the ayah. Similar ayat have occurred in other places in the Qur'an. One of the poets of the Prophet ﷺ, among his companions was Hassan ibn Thabit. Beautiful voice. He used to have Hassan ibn Thabit recite poetry to fire the troops up when they would go on military expeditions. He loved his voice so much, he calls him one time and he says, Hassan, recite Qur'an to me. And Hassan is shocked. Messenger of Allah, you want me to recite Qur'an to you? It was revealed to you. And he says, but I love to listen. And so he starts reciting Qur'an. He starts reciting Surah An-Nisa, the fourth surah. And he's reciting, and the messenger is enjoying the recitation, and he gets to an ayah. وَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِن كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ شَهِيدًا How will it be when we bring a witness against every nation? And we will bring you, meaning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we will bring you as a witness against these, meaning the Muslims. We will bring you as a witness against these. The Messenger alayhi salatu was salam, Hassan looks up, he looks at the Messenger's face, it is drenched in tears, and he's saying, Hasbuk, Hasbuk, stop, I can't take anymore. He asked him to stop reciting Quran at that point. Why? Because of the weight of what it means that the Messenger will be a witness against us. You know what that means? That means the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa before he left this world, before his worldly life, that component of his life came to an end. He took a witness from all of us. Did I deliver the message? Did I do my job? And we all testified as an ummah. Yes, adayta lamana. When asahta al ummah, you gave you 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 gave the trust. You passed it on. The trust that was given to you, you passed it on. Now fal yuballir shahid al ghaib. Then he says, then the one who is here better deliver it to the one who isn't here. You better be witnesses to humanity. And if we don't do this job. Guess who's going to be complaining about us on Judgment Day? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam These people, I left them a job I gave, they took witness that they will do this job And they knew this book and they didn't carry it It didn't re reflect in their personality it, the, the, the mouth opened but it never had the word of Allah on it It didn't have that on it You know, one of the scariest places in the Qur'an Allah Azza wa Jal talks about his messenger and he says وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبْ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا The messenger will say on that day Oh my master, this nation of mine abandoned the Qur'an Now I want you to appreciate the weight of these words So I'm gonna skip a little bit and I'm gonna go to the next ayah and share something with you You know the Qibla just changed, I told you, right? Is that a, it's, I don't think anyone here would think this is a small event Billions of people on the earth for generations to come from that time till now will be praying in a different direction because of that one decision. Because of that one decision. And now look what Allah says. He says, قَدْ نَرَى تَقَلُّبَ وَجْهِكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ فَلَا نُوَلِّيَنَّكَ قِبْلَةً تَرْضَاهَا Allah says to His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He says, we saw your face turn to the sky. The Messenger is in Medina. He's still praying towards Aqsa. His back is towards 
Mecca, and he misses the house that his father built. He, it hurts him that he has to turn his back to the house built by Ibrahim It hurts his feelings, but he doesn't complain to Allah. You know what he does? He looks at the sky. That's all he does. He just looks at the sky. And Allah reveals the ayah, we saw your face turning to the sky. Notice, you know loved ones among each other when you go home? If somebody really loves you, your mother really loves you. Your wife really loves you sometimes. But you know, <laughs> if, if there's a different, if there's an expression on your face, if there's an expression on your face, that's a little bit different. Your mother will say, something's wrong. What's going on? I say, oh, nothing, ma, nothing, nothing. No, no, I know you. I know that face. I see it in your eyes. And you say, I'm looking at the mirror. I see my eyes. I don't see anything. What do you see? <laughs> but that's the nature of someone who truly loves. The messenger didn't complain. The messenger didn't make dua. All he did was look at the sky. And the ayah is revealed of the Quran. We saw your face turning to the sky. Then for sure, we swear by it. There is no doubt whatsoever that we are turning your face. We are turning you in a direction. Tardaha. That pleases you. Allah is telling His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that this Qibla has changed so he could be happy. That's how much he loves his Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And imagine that Messenger who didn't even have to ask. Compare this to Musa Alaihi Salam. Read Surah Taha. Read Surah Al-Shu'ara. Read them. See how much Allah, Musa Alaihi Salam asks Allah. Oh Allah, they've got a crime against me. They're going to go kill me. Give me Harun. My tongue won't move. He's got a list of complaints. He's got a, he got a few problems before he goes back to Egypt. And Allah takes all of those complaints and addresses them. But with his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, something different. He didn't even have to open his mouth. He just looked up. And billions of people will pray in a different direction. So this man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, will be pleased. That's the relationship Allah has with his messenger. And if that messenger complains against you and me, what, what lawyer are you and I going to get? What case are we going to have? We have no case left. We have no case left. So when he says, وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا This job just became very serious. وَمَا جَعَلْنَا الْقِبْلَةِ الَّتِي كُنْتَ عَلَيْهَا إِلَّا لِنَعْلَمَ مَنْ يَتَّبِعُ الرَّسُولَ And we didn't put the Qibla you were committed to, meaning Al-Aqsa, Jerusalem. We didn't keep you on that Qibla, except to see who would really follow the messenger. It was a test of uh, loyalty. You know how it was a test of loyalty? The Muslims in Medina were used to praying towards Aqsa even before Islam. Now they have to turn. It's a test of their loyalty. The Muslims that were in Mecca were used to praying in what direction? Towards the Qibla. But when they came to Medina, they have to turn their back to the Qibla. It's not just the Prophet that has to turn his back. It's his companions that have to turn his back too. But now they have to make a choice between what they've been doing their entire life and following this man wasallam. And Allah says, I put this in place so I could test everybody. The Muhajirun and the Ansar. إِلَّا لِنَعْلَمَ مَنْ يَتَّبِعُ الرَّسُولِ مِمَّا يَنْقَلِبُ عَلَىٰ قِبَيْهِ From the one who turns back on his heels. I just wanted to see who's, who's loyal. You know? And then Allah Azza wa Jal finally adds, this is so beautiful. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِمَانَكُمْ The Yahud, the Jews were so offended that the Qibla changed, so they came up with taunts for the Muslims. So they came to the Muslims and they said, Hey, you've been praying in the wrong, in the wrong direction all these years, huh? All those prayers, nothing counted. It's your wrong direction. And some Muslims who didn't know any better even started worrying, maybe he's right. Because you know, these were the rabbis of that time, these are scholars of that time. So even if they're doing trash talk, it's coming from a reputable source. So you would, you'd first assume maybe there's some weight to it. Maybe they're right. Oh my God, all those prayers didn't count. And so Allah says in the same ayah, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِمَانَكُمْ Allah would never waste, and I'm going to translate here, and I'm going to say Allah will never waste your prayers. Allah would never be one to waste your prayers. But actually that's not what the Arabic says. The Arabic says Allah would never waste your faith. And there is a consensus among the companions of the Prophet Wasallam, And a consensus among every scholar after, on this word Iman in this ayah, that this word Iman means prayers. Iman usually means faith. But the question is, Allah could have just said Salawat. Allah could have said Allah won't waste your prayers. But He said Allah won't waste your Iman. You know why? Because to Allah, your salat and your iman are one and the same thing. There's no difference. When there's no salat, how can there be iman? It's one and the same to Allah. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِمَانَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِالنَّاسِ لَرَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ 
Certainly Allah is, especially when it comes to, to all people, He's compassionate and merciful. Ra'uf in Arabic is such a beautiful word. It means someone who knows what you're going through. Allah says He knows what you're going through. He knows the, tr the troubles you have. You know, when you try to talk to somebody about your problems, the first thought that comes to your mind is, man, he's not going to understand. He doesn't understand what I'm going through. Allah lets you know about himself that he is ra'uf. If there's no one who knows what you're going through, he does. He is ra'uf. Rahim. What a beautiful conclusion to this, us being inaugurated as an ummah. But now I want to share with you a concluding message. What does that mean that we've become an ummah and we share this responsibility? It means many things. But I want to at least leave you with one action item, one thing. The Messenger delivered a message to us. And that message in summary is this book, is Allah's book. He delivered that book, he gave his, his life mission was to deliver this book to the best of his ability and he did his job. He finished his job. Now, if you and I are responsible not only to deliver this book, but to represent its teachings in our character. Not only that, but to be closer to Allah, what better way to get close to Allah, but by uttering the words that He Himself gave you to utter. I can come up with a way to praise Allah on my own, but I will never be able to compete with how Allah praises Himself. I can come up with my own way of asking Allah for things, but I will never teach myself a better way to ask than the way Allah asked me to, told me to ask. Ask like this. Ask like this. If Allah says ask like this, like you know, Adam alayhi salam, is in deep trouble. He's been sent down to the earth. He's got to ask for forgiveness. But Allah says, He's so merciful. He says, if Adam alayhi salam might come up with his own way of asking for forgiveness, but Allah says, you know what? I'll give you the right words. فَتَلَقَّى أَدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ Adam alayhi salam was given words from his master. فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ Then he accepted his tawbah. <laughs> First he gave, say this, and once you say this, I'll accept your tawbah. That's Allah's book. The bottom line I have to share with you today. One of the big differences between us and Bani Israel, that they were nationalistic. That kept them from the truth. Allah made this, this guidance for humanity. You know what that means? When you and I say, La ilaha illallah, there is nothing between us stronger than that kalima. It is thicker than blood, it is thicker than the color of my skin, it is thicker than the country of my origin, or the accent on my tongue, it is thicker from my, than my, the, the, the origin of my ancestors. None of that is relevant now. What is relevant now is that you and I share, La ilaha illallah. That is relevant now. That is this ummah. That's what that means. That, that is what that means. And the way we keep that unity intact, and the way we keep that unity strong, Allah Azza wa Jal gave us a, a system by which we stand like a unified army every few hours, standing in a row, not by rank of age or color. By, but just by la ilaha illallah, you stand in one row and you don't get ahead of the other brother, make straight lines. And you do what when you get united? You recite Allah's word. So if you and I stand in salat and we don't understand Allah's word, we listen to the Qur'an being recited, and we don't get it. It's not our fault. We're not Arabs. I'm not Arab either. It's not our fault. The vast majority of this ummah is not Arab. They're not Arab. So your easy argument is, hey, I'm not Arab, it's not my fault. That's why I don't know the Qur'an. That's why I listen to it, it sounds kind of nice. But, uh, I, you know, I don't know what that means. I'll just read translation. Honestly, ask yourself this question. Who in the world is going to write a translation that will compete with Allah's words? Who's going to do that? Who's going to translate the beauty, the perfection, the guidance, the strength? You know, the effect of Allah's words. These are Allah's words. There's no alternative. There's no alternative. I'm trying to translate the ayat for you, but you've got to taste that sweetness yourself. Now, you ask, when, when that comes to mind, then we all understand. We all understand that the learning of this language for the sake of being able to say to Allah, I didn't come to this language, Ya Allah, I didn't learn this language so I can chit chat with the Imam sometimes. I didn't learn this language so I can order a shawarma at the Moroccan restaurant. I learned this language so when I make salat, that I can talk to you. That you're talking to me. That there's a conversation between us. And that conversation, you know, when the Quran is in our hearts and it's affecting us and we're understanding it, then unity becomes easy. It becomes easy. You're already physically together, now your hearts are together because they're unified by the same message. But right now, there's, there's not the same message when we're standing in Salat. It's a tragedy. It's a catastrophe. We need to work on this. We need to work on this. And I give you some historical backdrop, backdrop and I'm done. I tell you, the greatest, the greatest contributions 
to the study of the Arabic language was made by non-Arabs. The greatest contributions. You know the first compilation of Arabic grammar was made by a man named Sibawe. He compiled Arabic grammar as we study it today, non-Arab. The greatest mufassirun who talked about the linguistic beauty and perfection of the Qur'an were non-Arabs. They were non-Arabs. The vast majority of this ummah population-wise is non-Arabs. And the majority of scholarship of this ummah is also non-Arabs just by statistics. Some of our greatest scholars are sitting in places far from Arabia. To this day. To this day. It is not, a, it, what Allah did is something remarkable. He took the Arabic language and instead of making it the language of a people, instead of making it the language of a people from a certain race, a certain background, He made it a language of His own, of His book. So the messenger was asked at one occasion, what's an, you know, who's an Arab? Who's an Arab? You would say, oh, the people from Yemen, Sham, Syria, Jordan, these are Arabs. Inna al Arab lisan. Arabic, the Arab is just a language. Suhaib al-Rumi comes from Rome. He's a Roman. Salman al-Farisi comes from Persia. Bilal al-Habashi is from Abyssinia. But when they speak Arabic, and when they understand the Qur'an, by the Prophet's definition, they are Arabs. They are Arabs. And Islam didn't come. This Arabic language I'm emphasizing, not so that we get rid of the languages we have. No, no, no. That's not our history. That's not our history. But it's the common second language of all Muslims. It's a fundamental of all Muslims. At least at the level that you can enjoy your salat. You can know what's going on between you and Allah's word. At least that much. Then you ask yourself, and the question comes to mind, it's going to be hard. I can't do it. It's too much. I tried one time. And as soon as they talked about Rafa, Nasib, and Jarrah, I was like, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. I'm not, I, can't, I can't do this. I don't, I'm, not, I'm even bad at English grammar. How am I going to do Arabic? You know? It's way too much work. Just keep two things in your mind, and I promise you, you will have success. I promise you. You can come look me up if it doesn't work, okay? Two things. One thing is a promise of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the second thing is a promise of Allah. The first thing, the promise of the Messenger, this occurs in Bukhari. The Messenger says, Al Mahiru bil Qur'ani ma'a safara al kiram al barara. The expert in the Qur'an is ranked among the highest angels. The expert. Not you and me, the expert. He's way up there. Among the highest, al kiram al barara. These are the angels that record revelation, by the way. These are the top angels. And he says, And the one who reads the Qur'an and he stumbles in it. He reads and he can't get the ayn out, it hurts his throat. And the, the, the tajweed here says, Qaf, and he says, Kaf, and he says, Qaf, and he says, Kaf. And he says, Ayn, and he says, Ayn. And it's just not working. For six months, the ayn is working on. It's just not working. He stumbles in it. وَهُوَ عَلَيْهِ شَاقٍ And it's very hard on him. It's not, it doesn't come easy for him. لَهُ أَجْرَان He's got twice. The expert was ranked among the twi top angels. And the one who's struggling is twice that. Is twice that. That's the Prophet's promise. So if you're having a hard time learning Arabic, congratulations. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> um, seriously. Don't give it up. Because you're just... It's, you're just eating up the rewards. And here's the second promise. This promise is from Allah. He mentions this promise three times. You know why Quran repeats something multiple times? You know why? Because when someone needs to hear it more than once, Allah says it more than once. And maybe it didn't hit, the, hit you the first time, He says it again. Maybe it didn't hit you the second time, He says it again. Just like your mother, do your homework. Do your homework. Do your homework. Oh, you mean do my homework, you know. It takes a while. It takes a little while. What does Allah Azza wa Jalla say? He says, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ We already made the Qur'an incredibly easy. We made the Qur'an incredibly easy. Now he didn't say, what about the Qur'an? Is it memorization of the Qur'an? Is it the juid of the Qur'an? Is it the tafsir of the Qur'an? Is it the language of the Qur'an? He didn't restrict it to any one of these things, which means what? Everything. Everything about the Qur'an, who made easy? Not me, not you, not your teacher, not a curriculum, not a book. Allah made that easy, but then He put a condition on it. He said it's easy, but you only have one condition. وَلَقَدْ يَسَّدَ الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ If you have the intent of remembrance, if you really want to remember Allah, 
If you really, really want to remember Allah, and you say to Allah, you gave this salah so I can remember you. Aqimis salata li dhikri, Allah told Musa. Establish prayer so you can remember me. And if you really want to remember Allah, like He deserves to be remembered, and that is your motivation for learning anything about the Qur'an, if that's your motivation, then Allah's guarantee, not anybody else's, He will make it easy. He will make it easy, not anybody else. That's His promise. And you call Him on His promise. Oh Allah, you said you'll make it easy. I'm gonna try again. I know I tried five, six times before. But I'm gonna try again, because your promise I just got reminded. وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ But then he ends the ayah with a challenge, and I'll end with this challenge. As an ummah, one thing that will unite us is a unified love of this Qur'an. A unified love of encouraging each other to learn more of it, remind each other of it, learn it together. You know, Alhamdulillah, now you have an institute locally that the Imam has, has started with the Arabic program. Take part in it. Participate in it full-fledged. I mean, if you can't... Some of you have this like crazy notion that, yeah, inshallah, I'm gonna go abroad and study Arabic. You know, I'm gonna go to Syria or Jordan. You know, good for you. But if you've been saying that for 15 years, how about when that time comes, you do it, but right now, there's something right at your doorstep that Allah will ask you about. Why don't you take advantage of that? Why don't you take advantage of that? What is, what is on YouTube that's so important that you can't come to the masjid and learn? What is at home that's so important that you can't make time for Allah's book? What is it? Don't make excuses. Allah will know. You, I don't, you don't have to explain yourself to me or to the imam or to anyone else. But we better not have excuses before Allah Azza wa Jal. He says, فَهَلْ مِنْ Is there anyone out there? That's my figurative translation of فَهَلْ min. Is there anyone out there that is going to put even a little bit of effort to remember? مُدَّكِر not even muzdakir, this is idgham in sarf, or mutadakir, it's fused together, which does taqlil in Arabic. You know what that means? That means, is there anyone out there who will even put in a little bit of effort? I've made it so easy, you don't have to put a lot of effort. You just have to give me a little with sincerity and you see what I do for you. That's Allah's promise to us. And He says this three times. وَلَقَدْ يَسَّلْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ وَلَقَدْ يَسَّلْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ وَلَقَدْ يَسَّلْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ Three times over. Why? Because we need to hear it three times over. The way to unity of this ummah, to really be an ummah, is to be united. Is to be united. And Allah says, وَاعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ Jami'an, hold on to Allah's rope tightly. When you're all holding on to the same rope, you don't have a choice but to be next to each other. Because it's the same rope. That rope of Allah is the Qur'an. The more we're tied to the Qur'an, the more we're tied to each other. It is the, it's the glue that bonds us. It's the glue that bonds us. I pray sincerely to Allah that He opens up opportunities for you to become a student of His book, to learn more of His book, to memorize more of His book, to enjoy His book being recited in every single salat. I pray to Allah that He makes it easy for you to learn and He keeps your intention sincere and your motivation high. I pray that He's able to give you the ability to lead your families to become a family of learning Allah's book and continually growing in their knowledge and their love of this wonderful word of Allah Azza wa Jal. بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن الحكيم ونفعني وإياكم بالآيات والذكر الحكيم الحمد لله وكفاء والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا